Good morning, everybody. Welcome to Grace. Thank you for your presence here today. Thank you for your presence online. If you are new, I, I just want to welcome you. Thank you for joining us today at, at Grace. Uh, glad that you're here. Before I begin this morning, I, I do want to make you aware of something. I am so appreciative uh, over the past, man, how long has this corona thing been going on? Uh, forever, it feels like, right? Uh, you have been so faithful in supporting giving. And I just want you to know how much we appreciate that, that continues to allow us to do ministry to those who are able to be here, to those who are joining us online. Uh, it is your giving that has made that possible in so many areas that we have going on at the church. So I want to say thank you. One of the areas where your giving, your generosity has helped is something we call the Hope Fund. And maybe you've never heard of that before, but let me just explain to you what the Hope Fund is. It is a fund that we have and it's money that's set aside, given by you, to help people who are in need. And that's very, very important. And so I just want you to know today that, you know, if, if there's a need, or if you know that there's someone who has a need in the church family, uh, we have a fund it's, you know, that we use that we uh, designated money to help people in need. Which also means that if, if someone comes to you here at the church and they're asking for money, you can direct them to the church office, to the Hope Fund, where we can help meet whatever need they may have, okay? Everybody understand that? I just want you to know that that's available for you. You can, you, you know, if you want to give to the Hope Fund to help others out, you certainly can. We have uh, helped thousands and thousands of dollars, people in need. Uh, but if you have people coming to you or someone coming to you here at the church asking you for money, you can direct them directly to the Hope Fund where we have things set up to help people who are in need. So, Thank you so much for your giving. I appreciate it. Uh, before I, I begin as well, I just want to make sure, does everyone have your communion elements? If you did not get your communion, would you just hold your hand up? Uh, I see down over on this side. I see one right here. I, don't, I can't really see a whole lot more. But yeah, definitely over on the right side, Mike, uh, your left. Um, and just keep your hands up, and Mike will make sure you get that. Uh, it is so good to see you today. I, I want to talk to you this morning this message is kind of a follow-up to the last message of the last series. It is something that I had planned about two months ago as a single message, follow-up message to the last message of the last series. Um, and uh, it's important because of what we talked about. We talked about the importance of deeds and that doing good deeds is important. And if you don't do good deeds and you claim you have faith in Christ... There's something wrong with your claim, and if you missed that message, you can see it at our website, trygrace.com, trygrace at our YouTube channel, or on podcasts. One thing that I've learned uh, is that it's important to have a proper biblical understanding of faith and good works or good deeds, doing good. And it is possible that you can stress one over the other so that all that matters is faith, and it doesn't matter if you have any good works. And, and James is like, no, it doesn't work that way. But the other side is that you can stress good works, doing good deeds so much that faith seems almost irrelevant. And the confusion on this is evident. In a recent poll, I think it was taken last year, 52% of Americans who identify as Christians, 52%, more than half, said that they believed in a works-oriented righteousness. A works-oriented righteousness. In other words, they believed that my good is good enough to make me right with God. My good is good enough to get me into heaven. Now, today I want us to consider a question. This is not a James question. This is a Pastor Rob question, okay? But here's the question that I want us to keep in mind, uh, to, to think for ourselves, to consider and to keep in mind as we go through the message today, and that question is this, how good is my good? How good is my good? And I want you to ask that question of yourself right quick. Would you go ahead and ask that? How good is my good? How good are the things that I do in my life? In my life? Is, it, is, is it good? How good is my good? Does it make me a good person? Does my good make me a righteous person? I want you to know that it is possible to do good works without faith in Jesus. But it is impossible to have faith in Jesus 
and not do good works. See, you don't have to be a believer in Jesus to, in order... Are y'all okay this morning? I'm feeling really tired. I, I got really sick at the beginning of the week. I don't have COVID. I had three different tests, just to be clear, okay? Just so you know. I don't know what it was, but, it, man, it just it has sapped my energy. But it is possible. You don't have to be a believer in Jesus. You can be a believer in another religion. You don't have to believe in any God at all. And you can do good works. But James' point when talking about the issue of faith and good works is that it's impossible to have faith in Jesus and not do good works. And that is really the point of what James is getting to in his letter. It's why he asked the question, can such faith save you? The obvious answer is if you say you have faith in Jesus, but there is no evidence of that faith in deeds that you do in your life, the obvious answer to that question, can such faith save you, is... No. No way, no how, uh uh-uh. So if we overemphasize good works, doing good things, living a good life, what can happen is we can look at faith and go, really, what's the point of faith? I mean, is is it really necessary? And people will go, well, of course faith is necessary. But what has happened now, faith has become one of those things that people look at, and it's really not so important in uh, what you believe or who you believe, What's really important is what you do, your good works. So the question people ask is, if I can do good things without faith, what's the point of faith? Why do I need it? Why do I need to believe in Jesus? Why do I need to believe in the teachings of uh, Buddha, Islam, in Hinduism, or whatever other religion? Again, faith may have a place, but the thing that really matters, and the only thing that really seems to matter, is doing good. And so we make the main thing is doing good things. This is where we can come to when we get out of balance of understanding the importance of faith and a good life, good deeds. What do I need faith for? Because doing good is something virtually all religions agree with. You can ask Buddha, you can ask Krishna, you can ask the Dalai Lama. If you check out the teachings of Muhammad or Jesus, they all stress the importance of doing good deeds. And if faith isn't necessary to doing good deeds, what's the point of faith, right? I mean, why do good deeds at all? Why why do we even do good deeds? What's the point of good deeds? And when you ask people, why do I need to do good deeds and live a good life? It is often a question that trips people up. Because, see, the funny thing is that intuitively, down deep inside, we know that it's something we ought to do. We ought to do good. We ought to live a good life. But we have a hard time explaining that ought. You know, yes, but, well, why should I live a good life and do good deeds? Well, because you just should. I mean, that's not an answer. It's an answer, but it's not much of an answer, is it? I mean, there's nothing... There's no substance, to, no substance to it. So why should I live a good life? And many would say, well, you live a good life so that you can be a good person. <laughs> and that's the bar. I'm living a good life so I can be a good person. Is that it? Well, how much good is good enough well, or is enough to make me a good person? Is my good good enough to make me a good person? Is your good good enough to make you a good person? Person, And if it's not, what do I have to do to tip the scales in my favor? Anybody? You know? To what end are we doing all this? Do I, I do good so that I can be a good person so that people will look at me and go, that's a good person. Do I do good so that I can be a good person so I can stand in the mirror and look at myself and go, I'm a good person. Why, why do we do good? What is the point of doing good? <laughs> Who said we had to do good? You know, many people, religious leaders and, and religious teachers, religions, would say that good works and a good life are the key requirement for getting into heaven. That's why you have to do good works so, and live a good life so you can get into heaven, which, or nirvana or paradise or whatever it is you happen to call what's beyond death's door. By the way, what is beyond death's door? Do we know? Can we uh, answer that with any certainty? 
most Americans believe in heaven, it seems, that that's this case. Of course, now if you do a survey, not as many believe in hell. Isn't that funny? Most people believe in heaven, but not as many believe in hell. In fact, that survey that I quoted, the poll earlier, 54% of U.S. adults believe that when they die, they're going to heaven. And 2% said they believe they're going to hell. And I'm thinking to myself, if you're doing the poll, is someone just fudging numbers here, or did someone go, oh, yeah, man, I'm going to hell. This is great. I can't, I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't know, it just, maybe it's just because of me. But What happens to those that we know that aren't really good but aren't really bad? Where, where do they end up? You know, they're not really heaven material. Anybody know the people I'm talking about? They're not really heaven material, but you don't really want to see them in hell even though you don't believe in hell. You, you know, anybody know what I'm talking about? Those kind of people that are just kind of in between? What happens to them? Do they go to some temporary place like a, a purgatory, purgatory of sorts? Is, is, is there a, another alternate place between heaven and hell, this in-between place where people who aren't quite good enough but aren't quite bad enough, where they just, or do they just cease to exist? And who's to say? Who's going to make that call? Who's going to say, you, you get to heaven, you get hell, or, or you don't exist, or you're in this... Who, 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 makes, who makes that decision? Is it you? Is it me? Is it our culture? Is it religion? Is it God? Who decides who is good enough and who isn't good enough? Who makes that call? Who is going to stand as judge overall? We'll get to Scripture in a few minutes, okay? And if there is a judge overall, how will that judge judge you and me what criteria will he she or it use is is the criteria of our goodness or our that we're good enough is it our conscience our own little jiminy cricket that 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 i I don't know about you you know we you know we we let our conscience be our guide and we talk about this i don't know about you I, i i'm not really willing to put eternity, what's beyond death, I'm not willing to put that on my conscience because what I have found, and I bet you have too, is that you can do something and you have the best of intentions and it turned out horribly and your conscience eats you up and spits you out. Anybody? And, and, and what happens if your conscience is wrong? What if your conscience gets twisted? I mean, Pol Pot, Hitler, and all the thousands and thousands of people that followed them thought it was all right to exterminate Jews. They were following their conscience. Is that really what we want to be the criteria by which we're judged? Is it, our, is it keeping commandments? Every religion has certain commandments you have to keep. Is that what it is? You've got to keep. Christianity has, from the Old Testament, ten commandments. Well, actually, it's more than that. It, Jesus said there was two main commandments, But then there were the Ten Commandments from the Old Testament. And then on top of that, there's another 600 plus. So do you have to keep the the two? Do you need to keep the ten? Do you need to keep the 600 plus? And what happens if, if, if you mess up on a few of them? Does that mean you're not good enough? Is it our good works? Is that the basis why... We can get into heaven because we do good. We live a good life, and therefore I am a good person. And because of that, I should get into heaven. And that's what most religions and most religious teachers teach. I have to tell you that that raises some very serious questions for me. If this is the basis for why we get into heaven. And here's why. I've done some bad things. <laughs> Anybody willing to acknowledge that? You've done some things that are just wrong. Yeah, you know, I, I've done some bad things. Now, I'm not that bad. The only people I've killed has been like in Halo and Call of Duty, okay? But, so I'm not that bad. But listen, this is true. I'm not that bad is not really good, is it? That, that, seems, that doesn't seem to be the qualification that we want when we think about that. I'm not that bad is not 
really good? And how do I know that the good that I have done will outweigh the bad? I mean, who even says that I can do good enough to outweigh the bad that I've done? And is this why we do good? Is there some kind of scale, a standard that I'm being measured against? Is it, is it Mother Teresa? God help us all. Or even worse, if, what if the standard is God himself? Perfection. We all lose. No chance. See, in school, we knew we were going to get graded based on our performance. But at least we had material to study and to prepare. So if we failed, it was likely our fault because we didn't really study. But what is the material to pass this test so that when we die that we're considered good enough? You see, we need to under, ask this question, will my good be good enough? Will it? It's funny, when you read, read some of the big religious leaders who emphasize doing good, none of them felt very certain about their goodness when they were coming to the end of their life. See, this assumption that good people go to heaven, good people get what they deserve, bad people get what they deserve, is, is kind of underlying all of this. There's this assumption. I'm a good person, and I get what I deserve. And they're a bad person, and they get what they deserve. And I guess the thing that troubles me most about these, th this commonly held belief that I'm, I'm a good person, and I get what I deserve, and I'm going to heaven, is that what Jesus taught and what Jesus said and did. This is what really bothers me most about it. Because, see, Jesus, and you may not know this, he didn't teach good people go to heaven. He never taught that. You, you can read the New Testament. You can read every red letter that's in the New Testament of Jesus' words, and there's nothing in there about good people go to heaven. Nothing. In fact, Jesus taught that it isn't good people go to heaven. He, he actually pointed out that there's bad people going to heaven. And Jesus teaches us that God's desire and intent is not to give us what we deserve. God's desire and intent instead, you know, John 3.16 says that God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him would not perish but have everlasting life. God's desire, because this is why Jesus came, was so that we don't get what we deserve. And so, listen, God doesn't want us to get what we deserve. He said that God wants to give you and me what we don't deserve. And that went against, this is what Jesus said, and this went against the teaching in Jesus' day and ours. See, the religious leaders were the religious do-gooders. They did good, man. They looked holy. They dressed holy. They acted holy. They had the checklist of all the things that they needed to do, and they marked them off. If anyone was going to be good, it was these guys, these religious leaders. Was their good good enough? Jesus pointed them out to the crowd. <laughs> I don't think I'd want Jesus to use me as an illustration, just saying. But Jesus points out to the religious leaders and he says, I warn you, unless your righteousness is better than the righteousness of the teachers of the religious law and the Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Do you hear what Jesus is saying? Now, it's hard for us to understand because we don't, we don't have... Pharisees and the religious teachers of the law like they had back then. But I mean, these were like, these were like the cream of the crop. These were the, the holy men of their day. These were the do-gooders. And Jesus says, if, you're, if your goodness isn't better than their goodness, you're not getting into heaven. And you had to imagine that was a bit of a shock. And then later in Matthew 21, Jesus looks at the, the religious leaders and he points out the the bad people, the tax collectors and the prostitutes who were considered among the worst, the bad people that could have been. And Jesus says, you see them? They're getting into the kingdom of heaven ahead of you. <laughs> and so Jesus was turning everything upside down on its head. The religious leader's good wasn't good enough, and here's the bad people, and 
they're bad, and yet Jesus says they're getting into heaven. And it blew their mind. So you know what the good guys did? They got together and they said, we can't have Jesus running around talking about how much God loves bad people and that bad people are getting into heaven. So they had him crucified between two thieves, two criminals. And there on the cross, a fascinating discussion happens, conversation happens between two criminals and Jesus. And we find this in Luke chapter 23, verse 39. One of the criminals who hung there hurled insults. That literally means blasphemed. Blasphemed Jesus. Aren't you the Christ? Save yourself and us. So you, we, we need to get this picture. Three men crucified. This one who is <laughs> blaspheming Jesus, he's taunting Jesus, he's making fun of Jesus, is quickly approaching the end of his life. Rome Rome did not create or invent the crucifixion, but they perfected it. They perfected it. And this criminal is paying for his crimes with his life. But instead of acting like one of the guys who's being crucified, who's dying, whose life is at an end, he joins in with the people who are in the crowd. He joins in with the religious leaders. He joins in with the soldiers. He doesn't humble himself. He doesn't beg God for mercy. He doesn't acknowledge that what he has done in his life, the wrong that he has done, and confess it. He, he joins in with the others, and he bl mocks, he blasphemes, he taunts Jesus. Aren't you the Christ, the Messiah, the Son of God? I mean, that's what it says above your head. Do something. Save yourself. <laughs> and while you're at it, save us. The other criminal rebuked him. Don't you fear God, he said, since you are under the same sentence. We are punished justly, for we are getting what our deeds deserve. But this man has done nothing wrong. And here's, this is just this incredible paradox. One criminal blaspheming Jesus, the other criminal defending him. He acknowledges his own guilt. I am getting, listen, he says, I'm getting what I deserve. That's what he says. My deeds were not good, they were bad. He knows this. He is dying. And he makes this stunning request to Jesus. Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. This guy is at the end of his life. He's dying. He knows he deserves the punishment that he's getting. And here at the end of his life, he didn't have a chance to do better. He didn't have a chance to try to correct all the wrongs that he had done. He didn't have a chance to, to do enough good to outweigh the bad. He had nothing to offer. He had nothing to give Jesus. All he could do was say, Jesus, remember me. Here's something that is so important for us to see. If Jesus believed only good people go to heaven, this man stood no chance. What would you say to him? How would you respond to his last-minute conversion request, a parent show of repentance? How would you respond to his request where he really is, when he says, remember me, he's acknowledging, he's confessing that he's wrong, and he's asking Jesus for grace, for mercy, and forgiveness. How would you respond to that? Hanging on the cross, pierced hand and foot, bloodied and broken. Jesus responds and he says, I tell you the truth. Today you will be with me in paradise. Amazing. Absolutely amazing. Good people go to heaven, right? Not according to Jesus. 
just before dying, as one of his last acts, Jesus promises this guy that he will be with him in paradise, in heaven. Now, I want you to think about this for just a moment. Suppose that criminal who's being crucified, you're hearing all this that's going on, and Jesus is promising him heaven now, okay? And this criminal who's being crucified, you've come to see because he's done something against you or your family. Are you going to like the fact that Jesus is there saying, whoa, 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 whoa Jesus, how, whoa, that, that's not right. You can't promise. This is a bad man. He doesn't deserve heaven. He deserves hell. How can you, in this last moment, when he is paying for his sins, when he is getting what he deserves, how can you give that to him? That is unfair. But you know what the reality of God's grace is? It is unfair. God's grace is not fair. And see, you wouldn't think it would be right. I wouldn't think it would be right if my goodness is the basis for me getting into heaven. If my goodness is the basis for me getting to heaven, then that criminal absolutely deserved hell. I remember it was one of the first funerals that I had participated in when I came into ministry. It was a man who died. He wasn't particularly old, but he looked older. He had lived a hard life. He had been involved with alcohol, and you know all the things that alcohol leads to when it's consumed in excess. He was harsh, harsh to his wife, harsh with his daughter. And we had to do a funeral to celebrate his life. And I found one saving grace. Just days before he passed away, when there was nothing he could do to do enough good to counter the bad that he'd done in his life. There was nothing he could do to try to make his good good enough. This man, like three days before he died, asked Jesus to forgive him of his sins. So the one note of celebration I I was able to share in the funeral was that just as Jesus had forgiven the thief on the cross when there was nothing he could do. Jesus forgave this man. And it was an amazing thing to celebrate. Do you know what would be fair? What would be fair is if we got what we deserved. Do you know what was unfair? Jesus got what we deserved. But because he got what we deserved, we get what we don't deserve. And I'm glad today that God isn't fair, aren't you? I'm glad that he's not fair. He doesn't give us what we deserve. And this is scandalous. Tolian Chavidjan tweeted this. He said, it would be one thing if Jesus loved the falsely accused. That's not scandalous. What is scandalous is that Jesus loved the justly accused. And then he says this, the scandal of the gospel has always been who is let in. That's the scandal of the gospel. Who is let in? Who gets into the kingdom of heaven? Who gets to go to heaven? The scandal, this is the scandal of the gospel of Jesus. Because it's not about my goodness. It's not about fairness. It's about forgiveness. It's about forgiveness. In a world that says good people go to heaven, in a world that says my good is good enough, Jesus says no. Only forgiven people go to heaven. And this is what separates Christianity from virtually all other major religions that teach and believe that you need to do good to get to heaven. If you're doing something, you need to do better. If you don't have a list, you need to have a checklist. And if your checklist is too short, you need to add to it and have a longer checklist of things to do. And see, what what they don't tell you is that you're actually still practicing faith, okay? This is the important thing. You're, You're practicing faith, but what you're doing is you're putting faith in your own goodness, You're putting faith that my goodness will be sufficient to get me into heaven. 
When Jesus has expressly declared, no, it doesn't that way. So when we ask the question, how good is my good? Jesus' answer is, not good enough. My goodness is a poor place to put my faith. It is my bad to depend upon my good. It's, it is utter folly to put faith in my goodness. It is utter folly for you to put faith in your goodness. But you are putting your faith somewhere, in something or someone. And today, I want you to know the question isn't how good is my good? The question is, am I forgiven? One, put your faith in you. The other will cause you to put your faith in Jesus and what He did for you on the cross. We are putting our faith somewhere. And I want you to know that it is by grace, through God's scandalous grace, that we are forgiven when we put our faith in Him. See, Christianity teaches we need a Savior to rescue us, to forgive us, to redeem us. And when we put our faith in Jesus, say, I'm not trusting my goodness, oh God, I am trusting in what you did for me in Jesus. When we do that, we don't get what we deserve. We get what we don't deserve. See, good people don't go to heaven. Forgiven people do. Good people. Good people don't go to heaven. Jesus is clear on this. Forgiven people do. And I'm wondering today, what are you placing your faith in? Are you placing it in your goodness? Or are you placing it in His goodness? One will not get you into heaven. One will. As the night in Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade said when he's having to choose the cup, choose wisely because it is utter folly to put your faith and for me to put my faith in our goodness. But to put our faith in him, the one who loved us, who came and gave his life for us, that is the place where your faith and my faith belongs. It's in his goodness. And because, here's how it all ties together, and this is how the faith and the works comes together. When we do that, when we put our faith in Jesus, we're not depending upon our goodness but upon his. We're depending on his grace and mercy. He makes us right with God, and we demonstrate, demonstrate that rightness by what we do. Faith good works come together and we become the people that God wants us to be. What is your faith in? There is only one who can forgive your sins and make you right with God. And today, I encourage you to put your faith in Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Before we participate in communion today, I want to pray for you. So would you bow your head and close your eyes? Before I pray, I want to ask a question of you while your heads are bowed and your eyes are closed. Are you placing faith in your goodness? Or are you placing faith in his goodness? And if your faith is not in Jesus today, but you want it to be, you've been relying on something else, but you want it to be in Jesus, would you raise your hand so I can pray for you? Just hold it up so I can see you. I won't point you out. I won't call you out. I just want to pray for you. Is there anyone today? The Lord speaks to you, and as he is drawing you today, transfer your faith from your goodness into his. Heavenly Father, I am so thankful today that it is not by my goodness and it's not by our goodness that we stand before you as righteous. 
it is solely because of Jesus and what he has done. And we acknowledge that today. We confess that today. We realize that our goodness, as good as it may be, is never good enough. As Isaiah said, our righteousness is as filthy rags. I know that we live in a time and a place where we put so much confidence in our goodness. We live in a culture that does that, on our performance and what we do. But thank you that Jesus turned this all upside down so that our faith would not rest on ourselves, but that our faith would rest in Him. And thank you that because of your free gift, we are forgiven. We are free. We belong to you. We are your children. We are in the kingdom of God, and heaven awaits us. On the night that Jesus was betrayed, he took the bread, he broke it, he blessed it, and he said to his disciples, this is my body, which is broken for you. I want you to take and eat in remembrance of him. Would you take and eat today? In the same way, after supper, he took the cup and he said, this cup is the new covenant of my blood, which is being poured out for the forgiveness of sins. This, this is where it happens. This is why we're made right with God. And he said, take and drink in remembrance of me. Would you take and drink in remembrance of him? Father, thank you again today that because of Jesus, we do not stand in our own righteousness, but we stand in the righteousness of Christ. We are made right with God only because of what Jesus has done. And Father, I pray that as a result of that, because we are yours and we are your children, that as we walk out these doors, our faith will show itself in our deeds. Be glorified in us, we pray in Jesus' name. Everybody said, amen.